Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Building a Greener Community Conference 2021. My name is Mariam Rajabali, and I am a board member with Green Umma. In 2019, Green Umma began with the idea that the environmental movement must include a diversity of people, including Muslims, in order to have a healthier planet. This conference is aimed to serve that purpose and expand our reach so that we can inspire you to take action at home and in your local communities. We want to thank our sponsors and volunteers for making this conference possible. Without them, it would not be. Some of you have asked about posting on social media. Please do. We'd appreciate you tagging us at Green Umma with the hashtag GU2021. We hope that through social media, we can propel the conversation further than just in this space and in this time. Now, before we begin today's panel, it's important that we acknowledge the land on which we gather today. I am currently residing as an uninvited guest in the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Hodos Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge that as we're on a virtual platform, all of us are occupying different spaces. If you would like to learn more about the land which you're occupying, please visit native land.ca. Today's panel reflects on the question, how can we build an inclusive green movement? I'm so excited to welcome our moderator for today, Camille Kuhn. Camille's background is in nature-based programming and pedagogy and her commitment to equity led her to her current role as Naturehood's organizer at Nature Canada. As Naturehood organizer, she supports partners in connecting young people to nearby nature with a focus on addressing barriers experienced by racialized young people in a sustainable and community-driven way. Thank you for joining us, Camille. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I am so pleased to be in the company of this truly thoughtful, knowledgeable, and critical panel, who collectively have so many perspectives, experiences, and ideas related to this session's topic. Today, as mentioned, we seek to respond to the question, how can we build an inclusive green movement? Diverse, marginalized communities experience the brunt of environmental disparity. We know that marginalized communities experience complex and intersecting barriers to nature and the environmental movement. It is vital for the environmental movement to ensure environmental justice inclusive of marginalized communities most greatly impacted. I'm so pleased to be moderating this discussion between a number of individuals leading the way in answering today's question. On our panel, we have Asiya Hussein, an award-winning Canadian racialized Muslim woman with disabilities, accessibility professional, geographer, environmental professional, researcher, author, educator, outdoor professional, and community catalyst. Her experience includes inclusive barrier-free, accessible stewardship and conservation, sustainable development goals related to water, climate, and pollution, outdoor education, nature and, park, and parks, and natural resource management, disaster management, human rights, and intersections of environmental justice, disability justice, anti-racism, social justice, health, community development, governance, and barrier-free accessibility. Asia is the founder and CEO of Ecohesion, Canada's first and leading environmental organization with an intersectional disability lens. 
founded by racialized women with disabilities. She's also a member of the Federal Accessibility Standards, Canada's Technical Committee for Outdoor Spaces. Her lifelong love of the Rouge led her to become a key stakeholder in protecting it, establishing Rouge National Urban Park and the director of Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup at Rouge National Urban Park. She diversifies out, um, the outdoors with barrier-free, inclusive accessibility and, and safely helps people fill their nature prescription as a certified outdoor professional, Hike Ontario safe hiker and leader instructor. Her role includes serving with various environmental organizations, the government, academia, and in community development. Asia is nurtured by the strong Muslim women, elders, and, and scholars who raised her with Islamic studies and ethics, indigenous elders and knowledge keepers of Turtle Island in an anti-oppression lens through which she engages with diverse stakeholders. Asya offers unwavering solidarity and allyship with marginalized, racialized, indigenous, black, people of color, multi multicultural, interfaith, intergenerational and disability communities galvanizing her collaboration with these diverse communities, civil society, academia, industry, and, and gov government and non-governmental organizations to leave no one behind among the most vulnerable of people, planet, and the everlasting. Also on this panel, we have Chuck Odanibo, um, Franco Albert, <laughs> Albertan from Calgary. Uh, Chuck is incredibly passionate about the interactions between culture, health, and the environment. The passion manifests itself in three primary roles as founding director of Future Ancestors Services, an Indigenous and Black-owned youth-led professional services social enterprise that advances climate justice and equity with a lens of anti-racism and ancestral accountability. Co-founder of The Poison and the Apple, an Albertan-born bilingual nonprofit organization that seeks to change the way in which Canadians interact with nature at a socio-cultural level in order to diversify outdoor spaces and make nature truly for all and PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa in medical geography, where, where his research looks at the relationship between human health, the environment, geographic factors, society, and healthcare to shed light on public health policies and strategies. Chuck is recognized as an expert in healthy parks and healthy people, originally from Australia, the Healthy Parks and Healthy People movement approaches the relationship between humanity and nature from a health and healthcare perspective in order to create and influence programs and policies to improve public health through parks and natural areas. He has spoken on several international and local conferences, taught undergraduate courses and courses for professionals, and led important discussions on climate change and youth engagement with multiple agencies, and has been highly recognized for all his work. And with that, that is our wonderful panel. I'm so excited to hear <laughs> what everybody has to say about our first question. Um, so I'll let this be an open question to both panelists. What are what are the unique barriers faced by racialized, indigenous, black, people of color, gender diverse, and disability communities in environmental justice, accessing nature, and engaging in the environmental movement? So with that, I'll leave it to both of you to chime in. Who would you like to go first? Would you like to start us off, Asiya? Well, with that, <laughs> um, well, greetings, everyone. Um, Anin, assalamu alaikum. Um, I think when you, when we're looking at barriers and we're looking at um, 
for this uh, intersectionality, I think we'll be remiss if we don't first acknowledge um, with deep respect and honor the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island of whom this uh, indigenous led conservation since time immemorial is, is what we're all um, uh, kind of um, being galvanized by and, and even on this panel coming with um, traditions and in our backgrounds that, that echo this as well. And so therein lies the irony of, of the marginalized um, experiencing that uh, these barriers and, and that which impact us most in me coming as a racialized Muslim woman with disabilities, um, being in acute vulnerability to disparate impacts of, of the environmental crises that we're all facing on, on this shared planet. Um, and, and the uniqueness of what that means as an outdoor professional who also experiences barriers in getting into nature. Um, and so if we look at some of these unique um, disparities, um, <clears throat> you know, um, so I can speak from it from a racialized woman's disability perspective from my lived experience. And then also as uh, I guess a professional in, in this as well, in that let's take for example, uh, the climate crisis and, and climate justice or just environmental justice in itself. If we break it down, what is justice and what is social justice? It is removing the unjust barriers that, that people face. And to remove barriers is to seek accessibility. So we cannot have social justice or environmental justice without accessibility. And inherently environmental justice is disability justice, is climate justice. If, for example, there is an extreme weather event, if there is a flood or if there is an ice storm, et cetera, et cetera, if there's an earthquake, people like me who are wheelchair users or people who might be deaf or people who might be blind, people who are experiencing um, this uh, systemic uh, environmental ableism, I'll call it, um, will have barriers to evacuation, to uh, getting alerts, to um, where we would shelter, whether we can even um, uh, return. Um, and, and, you know, in, in tsunamis, uh, including the one uh, um, several years ago in, in 2007, um, you know, all estimated 700 people with polio in, 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 in that region, um, uh, in Asia, that, in that specific area that, that received um, this catastrophic event um perished because of not having an accessible way to flee um and you know we're looking at this even in the health realm i think um uh, chuck might even be able to speak more about it with with his phd research um it's it's something that impacts us all um uh it's it's inducing things like asthma right it's it's these, these are all um, things that impact us all, but um, unfortunately, the ones who are the most very, uh, vulnerable are not only bearing the brunt, but we're also leading in tangible action. And so I'm asking all who are joining us, um, all who are, who are um, in our shared world who may be less vulnerable to use this privilege as, as allies, um, to center and amplify these vulnerable voices and to collaborate in ways in which we don't leave the most vulnerable behind. Um, and we can go more into that in, in a discussion in regards to, um, you know, as we, as we flow in our, in our, in our conversation. Thanks so much, Asia. Um, Chuck, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, Asya did a phenomenal job sort of introducing the, the subject because it is a very sort of large question. Um, so to the book, hello, je m'appelle Chuck. Hi, everyone, my name is Chuck. Um, and so when I think about the unique barriers faced by people in terms of engaging with nature, accessing nature and engaging with the environmental movement, I'm going to speak from my perspective as a Black Francophone male, sort of in the same way that Asya spoke from her perspective as a racialized disabled woman. And so when I think back to, to my childhood, my favorite activity to do in outdoor spaces was to read a book under a tree. That was my favorite thing to do. That's how I connect with nature. Um, and 
you know, gave me warm feelings to think about those moments. And then at a certain, at a certain age, uh, whenever I'd go into outdoor spaces, you know, people would sort of criticize what I was wearing, be like, are you really wearing that to that outdoor space? They would criticize um, my preferred activities to do, or are you just going to read a book? You're not going to go on a hike. You're not going to go camping. You're not really a woodsy person, Chuck. You're not really an outdoorsy person. That's not really your thing. And so at a certain moment, I started believing it. I was like, oh, I guess the outdoors just isn't for me. And so when you couple this sort of um, intrinsic culture we see in outdoor spaces where effectively um, the people who've been trying to protect nature in Canada from a colonial perspective um, essentially have selected almost an arbitrary moment in time and tried to freeze nature in that arbitrary moment in time. And so when you have a culture of, you know, conservation, when you have a culture that really seeks to not have nature develop and continue to advance um, in pace with humanity, you essentially have a culture that becomes very intrinsic upon itself. And so the people who enter this industry tend to be people who their parents were in conservation, their grandparents were in conservation, their great grandparents were in conservation. And so it creates this cyclical culture that makes it hard to break into. So you take that and you couple it with the fact that, you know, I come from um, an immigrant African background. And so um, when it comes to blackness and nature spaces in uh, North America, there's a twisted history in link with colonialism, right? So black people effectively have been taught through history that nature is not for them or that nature would be used as a tool to abuse them. So to sort of um, contextualize this within um, case studies and examples, you've got sort of the plantations, right? Where black people were whipped, beaten and dehumanized in an effort to do farming. And so today in Canada, you see a lot of black people avoid agricultural areas and, and don't even consider farming as a potential sort of career option. Then you've got the, the safety component as well. Nature symbolized um, sort of that whole idea of being dehumanized, symbolized being one of an animal. And for black people, we have had to fight for decades and we're still fighting today to be recognized as human beings. And so one of the ways black people create that recognition is by being very, very highly urban to the point where Canada's black population is 94% urban. We are more urban than any other immigrant population in Canada. So that is, you. so you have this distancing from nature, this whole idea of, nature isn't for us. And so I remember when I asked my parents, oh, can I go do camping with my friends? My, friend, my parents were like, why would you ever want to degrade yourself like that? Why would you want to uh, dehumanize yourself like that? And I'm like, what? How is that? So you kind of have that, that narrative being perpetuated within black communities um, that was brought on through colonization. And then you've got the narrative within conservation communities that you do not belong because you do not behave and think like us. And so it's, you've got all these sort of barriers where in the, most, in the most multicultural country in the world, we have branded nature. We have given nature a face, we've given nature a culture. And if you don't you see yourself in that culture, if you don't recognize that face in yourself, you say nature is not for you. And then you combat it with a lot of the messaging that has passed along as a result of colonization, as a result of um, a lot of discriminatory principles that were put in place in Canada in the past. And you have a, a set of very real barriers that prevent people from being able to see themselves in outdoor spaces and connect uh, to outdoor spaces. I'm trying to be cognizant of time, so I'm going to stop myself here. But um, there's so much more to say on that subject matter. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate your diverse experiences and how you've both um, approached this question from different perspectives. Um, before we jump into the next question, I just wanted to open it to both of you if you had any quest follow-up questions to each other, um, just in the nature of um, building the discussion around this before we jump in. Um, well, I think I think when we look on a, on a, on a deep level as well, I mean, if when we're thinking about an environmental movement, um, I mean, Chuck is absolutely right. It is, it is, um, 
we are living in a in a legacy of uh, of colonialism and of who uh, gets to speak from a mic um, and whose voices are being um, amplified to be heard, right? Um, and that also impacts, you know, um, things like decision making um, in, um, well, let's say, for example, environmental racism, where it intersects with environmental ableism, um, and where sites are chosen, um, and where resources are chosen to dismantle the disparities. We have 20% of the world's freshwater in Canada, and yet over one in nine uh, First Nations reserves are living in intergenerational trauma, like in generations upon generations upon generations of, of boil water advisories. How is this just? Or where sites are chosen for the most dangerous exposures to be placed where Indigenous and Black communities reside? Or where we may be growing up in urban spaces and have no idea that there's nature right in our backyard? Or that we are, um, we are raised in a context in which uh, nature is something to be feared mm -hmm. because it's where our peoples had to flee when we were being hunted, <laughs> right? Um, and, and yet um, at the same time, when we reconnect with nature is, that's when we're more inclined to cherish it. And so these are all these, these, these things I'm just thinking of as, I, as I'm listening to my wonderful co-panelist here. And, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on this because so, well, I mean, you come from a, like a, a medical geographer, I'm a geographer and you're coming from a medical geographer uh, background. And I, I would love to hear your insight on this. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, I, I love these topics because I think they engender very important conversations that need to be had in more public forums. So I was thinking, um, especially as you're speaking, I was thinking about the ways in which who has the mic is incredibly important in making nature for everybody. So in Australia, for example, um, they wanted to get more blind people to visit parks. That was something that was that was something that they were that was important to them, and so they um, translated all of the signage uh, to Braille, and provided maps in Braille and all that fun stuff, um, just so that blind people would be able to sort of navigate this park. And a couple of months later, they did you know one of those surveys to verify to see you know what the impact has been, and they did not see any sort of increase in the number of blind visitors. And they're like, why aren't blind people coming? And so then, and you think they should do this beforehand, but I guess to some of us, this is common sense to other people, it doesn't even occur to them. They were like, maybe let's contact representatives of the blind community <laughs> to find out <laughs> why they would like to come to a park. <laughs> and so they did that. And the representatives were like, blind people would like their nature experience to be a social experience. They want to be able to meet with people. They want to make new friends. Uh, a lot of them feel isolated in their own homes and their own communities because you know you kind of can only move around places that you know about and you feel confident moving around. Um, and so this would be a way for them to get to know a new place and they want to get to know a new place at the same time as get to know a new person. They want it to be social. And so Parks Victoria took that feedback and created a, um, oh, a pairing program in the infant would say program de jumelage, like a, where you pair people together. And so you pair a seeing person, a seeing volunteer with a blind person. Um, and so a bus of blind people would come from, uh, from town and they would be, each of them would be paired with a single seeing person. They were given a little bit of a budget to be able to have a picnic. And the seeing person would take them to the park to, you know, if nothing else, have a beautiful conversation or ideally become friends. Um, they'd have a picnic together. They'd walk around the seeing person and explain what is, what, what is around and the blind person sort of enjoyed this auditory tour of the park and it became a very successful program but for that program to become successful they had to have a conversation they had to hold space for this community and so it's something that uh, you were kind of alluding to asia is in canada we don't see that holding space to often like a lot of us i know myself personally we had to break in we had to almost force ourselves in versus being invited 
and being like, let's hear your perspective. What can we do to get people who share your identities into green spaces? It was more me breaking in being like, we need to change. <laughs> can we change right now? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, th thank you both so much for adding to that conversation. I think it naturally we're kind of guiding ourselves into the next question. I'm just going to interrupt myself for a moment to remind the audience that we have a Q&A function. Um, so you can ask your questions um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of this session um, in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Is it okay if I respond to that before we... Oh, so... Uh, Sure, briefly. One minute. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, I am visually impaired. I hide it very well. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and so it's, uh, it's, I have various disabilities. And so, I mean, it's, this is, and I'm also on a, on, 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 um, a technical committee trying to make outdoor spaces uh, uh, barrier free and accessible. And so, you know, there are so many different ways that we can engage with nature. And it's, it's, um, you know, for someone like me, it's, it's going to be multi-sensory, right? It may not necessarily be social either, but um, because everyone is different, like you, you might have want to have that solitary moment to just be and just exist in nature, right? Or you might want to have a physical experience as well. Um, so th there, and this is what's going to be a, a really important in, in, in this panel. And then as everyone goes back as well, if we, if we take from uh, the values as well um, and amplify them from the from disability justice there is a phrase nothing about us without us and so this is in, so important so important when we're looking at engaging marginalized communities um, you know it uh, you cannot assume of something because they may not necessarily show up or that survey may not have been accessible <laughs> right um, and, and so that's something really important to, to keep in mind. So I just, I just thought maybe I'll, I'll touch on that as, right before we go to the next question. Yeah, thanks so much for emphasizing that point. That's a great addition. Um, so our next question to this panel is how can we address these disparities for barrier-free inclusion and environmental justice? What are examples from your work in this from which we can all learn? Um, Chuck, did you wanna start this one off? Absolutely. I also wanted to say that I was nodding vigorously as you, as you were speaking, just in case my head bobbing up and down was not super clear. I want to make sure that I said it. I was nodding vigorously. <laughs> um, again, this question is incredibly large. Oh, uh, yeah. So this question is incredibly large. Um, how can we address these disparities for very free inclusion? So it's kind of as Asia was saying, um, nothing about us without us, right? It's, um, you know, if you want to include people, you need to have people, at least representatives of various identities and communities um, who are educated on the needs of the communities at the table to, um, to lead these discussions and to lead what sort of um, needs to happen. So I think, oof. I think let me try and structure my answer in a way that um, hopefully will make sense to other people. So when I think about ways in which we can address these disparities, I think about sociocultural change uh, as a, a collectively as a society, because everything is very strongly linked, right? So if we think about anti-Indigenous racism, for example, uh, we live in a society where um, Indigenous people are seen as less than um, we live in a society where within five years of arriving in Canada, immigrants develop prejudice against Indigenous people in Canada. And what, if, what that effectively leads to is when you see yourself as superior to someone or to superior to a group of people, you then see the, your form of knowledge production as superior to their form of knowledge production. And given that Indigenous people have lived on these lands since time immemorial, that they become e part of the ecosystems of these lands, um, the teachings are just as trustworthy as science, right? Because they've been verified over thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so we end up ignoring those teachings, making decisions that go contrary to those teachings, see the consequences and go, whoops, I guess you're right. And that is, that is something that we need to change, right? So when we see movements about racism, it's for those kind of reasons. When we think about anti-Black racism, 
um, black people, for some reason, sort of symbolize nature to a lot of people in pop culture, especially. So we have um, sort of the ways in which we see black, sorry, not black, earth-based abilities represented in pop culture settings. Uh, for example, if we look at um, uh, Frozen 2, uh, which is a very cute movie set in Scandinavia, uh, the earth spirits look like black people. And when you think about farming, when you think about, you know, um, hunting, when you think about a lot of these sort of um, quote unquote nature driven activities, we, we imagine, uh, we imagine black faces, we imagine whether we're imagining traditional Africans, whether we're imagining sort of more indigenous people, but we imagine these cultures that were built around the environment. So we tend to black code nature. And so if we live in a society that can't respect black people, if you live in a society where if a black person is having a mental health breakdown, they're more, they're very likely to be killed. Um, you know, that's, then how do we expect that same society to turn around and represent and so, and respect nature and the environment? And then if we look at uh, sexism, right? So we have highly feminized the environment. We always talk about mother nature, everything sea related is female. And so because, nature and the environment are so heavily feminized. When we talk about the gender page gap, when you talk about hashtag the Me Too movement, um, we're talking about, you know, valuing women for existing, valuing them for their bodily autonomy versus valuing a woman because she is someone's wife, you know, someone's daughter, someone's sister, valuing them in relation to men, we're trying to value them as individuals. And when you compare that to the environment, you know, we need to be able to value nature because it exists, value ecosystems because they exist, not value them because of what they're able to provide to human beings. Because sometimes, and a lot of times, we don't necessarily know what something provides to us until it's gone, right? And so being able to see those values. And so it's all, so all of this is linked to the isms and the phobias, right? The sexism, racism, um, anti-Semitism, the Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, like, isms and the phobias. And so when I don't see environmentalists on the front lines of social justice uh, movements and trying their best to really enhance, support, amplify the social justice movements, I then question if they truly care about the environment because the environment, the, our relationship as a society collectively with the environment will never improve if we can't even treat each other who we use to personify the environment in different ways with respect. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Asiya, so I don't take up too much time, but I wanted to sort of uh, start from that perspective. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I think um, these are really important um, intersections that the audience and all of us are hearing. Um, and uh, I might uh, look at it at a macro level and then also like maybe some tangible ideas too, and we can, we can bounce off each other some, some thoughts as well. Um, like on a deep level, um, the thing that's going to dismantle barriers to begin with is to first uh, rehumanize the people who are dehumanized. And I mean, what what is what is at the foundation of environmental ableism, environmental uh, 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 racism, etc.? It's eugenics, right? It's devaluing a human being at their very core to be unworthy of justice and equity. It's devaluing earth at its very core to be unworthy of anything except consumption, right? And so how are we gonna revalue that as worthy of being uh, a, a worthy of justice, worthy of, of protection, worthy of, um, uh, you know, of of of, uh, of of being of, of of being something that we have that intrinsic connection to. We learned that in yesterday's, so, and so I'm going to tie in all of these conversations. Um, yet yesterday, a panelist was asked, "Well, how are we going to create this paradigm shift?" And Memona Hussein answered, "Connection, right? When you're when when you're connected to something, you're thinking about it. It's in the forefront of your mind. You're more inclined to create a paradigm shift." So we have to do that first. We have to dismantle the roots of, 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 uh, of, of this eugenics and of, uh, I guess, ecocide. <laughs> um, 
And, um, and, and from there, when you have that value, first of all, it's not just something that you're doing because you're required, you know, you're, you're mandated um, to, 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 to accommodate accessibility. It's because you, you, you value this human being, you value this shared experience in our shared planet and, 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 and uh, in people um, as being worthy. Um, and, and so now looking at tools to do that, um, uh, you know, whether it be nature, whether it be, um, you know, dismantling um, um, all the disparities that we're experiencing with the climate crisis, or um, I, I mentioned water, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's really going to the, the core of how are these decisions being made? And again, that goes back to value and bringing people at the table with this nothing about us without us to leave no one behind. Because without that, you know, you're, everyone's going to be working in silos. So you need these diverse um, um, uh, voices that also are contributing to um, the solutions. Because like, I can tell you right here, the disability community, we are, it's infused within us to be resilient. It's infused within us to break down the barriers that we face every day just to exist, let alone forget even thriving just to exist, right? And so when you bring this expertise, you're bringing innovation, you are bringing solutions to that which is plaguing all of us. And when you're, when, when you're, when you're accommodating, not just accommodating, when you're including and breaking down barriers of what the most vulnerable are experiencing, you are making the entire world more resilient. For example, if we know that with every 1% rise in, in, in the Earth's temperature, it will cause such and such. Well, even a microscopic amount is going to shut down the lungs of people with, <laughs> with, with, with um, respiratory conditions, right? So if we work towards the most vulnerable, we will assist everybody. Um, and so that will be the, the macro level. Um, smaller uh, ideas uh, that I'm thinking of that, that are not smaller, but like tangible ideas. If we're looking at reconnecting with nature and, and you, your prior question was from our, our work that we do, um, uh, Ecohesion runs right now the, the only and foremost, um, uh, we run Nature Reconnect, uh, a program which is connecting people uh, with nature um, through that barrier-free inclusive accessibility to leave no one behind who are the most vulnerable to be um, uh, excluded and marginalized from, from this, this sacred connection. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a part of our wellness too. Physicians are now prescribing nature uh, for our health, um, you know. And so to replenish vitamin N, nature is is really important. And and so um, creating what, so I, I welcome you all to to check our, our website ecohesion.ca um, on 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 how that program is going and how to collaborate. And so um, you know um, you know. That, that's one way um, of doing that with the nothing about us without us. You have the experts who are experiencing that in, in their lives who can say, well, this is what's going to make me included, right? And another thing, number two, is remuneration. If you're going to have these diverse voices come, pay them for it, right? This is value, right? That's coming to make you more resilient. The Indigenous voices that are coming, pay them hefty amounts. There is going to be no amount of reparation that could be done for the injustices that, that right? But, but, but try, right? Um, and number three, um, um, you know, we really have to look at things uh, on a governance level as well, because unless something is put in place to make it mandatory, uh, um, it, it, uh, it will remain voluntary as, as a you may, you know, versus you shall you must do this, right? Um, so I think looking at it from, from a holistic realm and then, you know, whether it's civil society, and so when I mean civil society, like the people, NGOs, academia, uh, linking the silos through which everyone is, is kind of working is going to be important. Um, I'm going to pass the mic back because I, I see we have, a, we have one of our panelists here who didn't get to speak yet.
Thanks so much, um, both of you, for both the macro level and then bringing it down to the work that you're actively doing. That's that's really great to learn about. Um, we do also have Demisha Dennis here from Brown Girl Outdoor World. So maybe I'll pass the Q and A's um, to you, Demisha, if you're prepared to um, speak to this work. So um, one of the interesting questions I'm seeing is how has COVID-19 changed or interrupted the work to create an equitable, inclusive environmental movement? Hey, Demisha. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. You'd think almost a year or over a year and we'd be used to this by now and unmuting ourselves as we get on. Um, so can you repeat the question for me, my... Uh... Yeah, of course. So how has COVID-19 changed or interrupted the work to create equitable, inclusive uh, environmental movements? Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's really changed it per se. It's, it's caused people to pay attention more because people are now, you know, people are more in tune, we're slowed down, we're listening, we're looking, and we're seeing things that before we probably never paid any attention to. So I think in a way it's, it's helped us to become more aware of, of environmental, you know, environmental, environmental justice issues, environmental injustice issues. Um, so I don't think it's really disrupted it. I think it's given us more room to pay attention and to, to call us into being into the space of understanding that this, this whole thing is, is greater than us and it's gonna take all of us to actively work to make any change around it. Thanks so much, Demisha. Um, Chuck, I know you, you had something to add to this. Did you wanna chime in? We have uh, maybe two more minutes for this question. Oh, I love this question. How does COVID change interrupted the work to create an equitable, inclusive environmental movement? I think, and I'm so sorry, ASL translators, I'm going to speak a little bit faster to accommodate the two minutes. Um, so I think that COVID has kind of, as Demisha uh, mentioned, not just highlighted things, but also put things in, in fast forward. So essentially with, um, with climate change, we know that it's going to have negative impacts on certain communities. We know that there's going to be a sociopolitical, sociocultural vulnerability. Um, and so the current approach is that governments who are recognizing climate change and who are trying to create um, policies and resilience surrounding climate change and the impacts of climate change, they are going at it from a very sort of detached science perspective where they're sort of treating society as if it's some sort of equal society and thus the um, impacts of climate change will um, happen at an equal in an equal manner. But in recognizing that we live in an unjust and unequal society and COVID-19 highlighting that very dramatically, um, it's taught us two very key things. I mean, it's taught us multiple things, but I'm gonna say two very key things. Key thing number one, it's taught us that um, no, you know, if a virus has no eyes, a virus is not like, oh my God, he's black, I'm going, uh, I'm going to like infect him and she's not black. So you know what, I'm gonna stay away from her. A virus doesn't do that. Yet somehow it's almost as if it does because we're seeing the ways in which certain communities are more impacted than other communities and it is not for biological reasons. And so that's when we start realizing, oh, there, it's possible to be vulnerable to something without being biologically susceptible to it. And so in recognizing that, hopefully we can take that learning and implement it into climate change measures to recognize that certain communities are going to need a lot more help than other communities. And we need to be able to redirect our focus around that. The second thing that we need to learn about um, from COVID-19 is that people will literally be in downtown Toronto a block away from a hospital where people are dying of COVID and say COVID does not exist, which means there is literally no point in trying to cater to <laughs> Um, deniers, because the denial is not based in science, it's not based in reality, it's based on alternative facts. And there's many psychological and psychosocial reasons for that denial, but essentially uh, we see a lot of politicians trying to sort of dance this middle line of being like, oh, like we want to listen to both sides and cater to both sides. That only works if we're fighting about a solution, but we've agreed upon the problem. If you're fighting about the problem in the first place, when science has told us this problem exists, there's no purpose in wasting our energy trying to be like, oh, let us try and sort of soften this a little bit to make the climate change deniers feel better. That's not, that's not an appropriate thing to do because we're all in the same boat. And by the time someone realizes that they may have been wrong as a denier, it's often 
too late. We all have seen all the stories about the uh, COVID deniers who got COVID, who were in hospital, who were on ventilators and were like, oh my God, I feel so bad that they denied it. They had to almost die to feel bad. But like with climate change, if it's like a flood, then I'm dying too. So <laughs> let's not uh, sort of do that. And within the same vein as well, um, even the people who aren't denying COVID, and so even the people who are denying climate change, we can see this level of, of discrimination that's embedded in their mentality. And then if we cater to that mentality, we're catering to that discrimination. So there's a lot of people who are like, oh, but you know, only like 5% of people die from COVID, COVID and it's only people with comorbidities, like it's not a big deal. And kind of as um, SEO was mentioning, that is inherently ableist. Right, it's people who have different um, di disabilities that make it more difficult to breathe, that have immune disabilities, that have all these other things. And what they're effectively saying is, rather than let's take in measures that put these people into consideration as they're the most at risk, and if they're in consideration, that means those of us who are less at risk are going to be a lot more comfortable. It's like, no, let's sacrifice them. And it's not even sacrifice them for the good of the common, the common good. It's let's sacrifice them just so that the status quo remains. So that's the two things that I hope that people take away from COVID. Number one is that um, we need to address things in, a socio in recognizing sociopolitical vulnerability. And number two is that we cannot be catering to the deniers and to those whose opinions are based in discrimination because the second we do that, we are then implementing and integrating this um, discrimination into our programs, policies, and ways of adaptation. Thanks so much for that. Um, it is time to pass it back to Green Uma, but I know, Asya, you have uh, 30 seconds to chime in. I know it's really an important question for you, so I just wanted to get your voice in. Okay, 30 seconds. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for all the people who are saying it's just, oh, it's just going to be the bone. It's just going to be people with disabilities who are going to die from this. It's just, it's just the seniors. It's just the people who are immune compromised. We can hear you. Okay. We can hear you and it's ugly. Um, this is what is called, uh, it's, it's a, eugenics ableism and it's not okay. And actually 83% uh, of Tocanto, where I live, Tocanto COVID-19 patients are racialized uh, Black people um uh, uh people of color and of those the highest ones that are dying the most are people with disabilities of those the ones who have the highest mortality are the ones who have complex medical condition um uh, uh disabilities and 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 if people think that they're immune to these things then i'm, I'm really sorry to say that even young people who are healthy are also perishing um, and so if we want to overcome this pandemic, uh, this, we have to also be cognizant and acknowledge, just as we acknowledge the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, we must acknowledge that people with disabilities have been living pandemic life forever, long before this pandemic came and long after it will pass. One of the things that COVID-19 has brought and shown the entire world is that everything that people, that marginalized communities have been begging for that we should never ever have to beg for the accommodations and the inclusion that we deserve to dismantle these disparities. Um, the moment that it experienced, it was experienced by people of a little bit more privilege, we ex just like that, it became accessible, right? So what I'm gonna ask is what is, gonna, what is a just recovery going to look like for people and planet? Thanks so much, everyone, for all your contributions, um, for sharing your personal experiences, um, as well as all your expertise on this topic. Thanks so much. And I pass it to you, Marianne. Thank you, Camille. And thank you, Asya, Chuck, and Demisha. We really appreciate everything that you've spoken about. Um, and I think this will just be the beginning of starting this conversation. Um, so for attendees, you are welcome to join us back at 1.35. That is when the next session starts. Um, so please join us back at that time. Uh, if anyone has any issues joining or if anyone needs the link that hasn't received it yet, please email info at greenuma.org. Thank you.